Thank you, Cultural Club, Fazlali College, for that beautiful song. And now do welcome all the participants who are attending physically, as well as those who are attending online, and our media friends. I give the time to our principal and also the convener of this international conference. Dear Chairperson, Dr. Aaron, Assistant Professor, NHOD of English Department, Fazlali College, our honored inaugural guest, Professor Timjin Susa, Director, RDC, Nagaland University, our keynote and invited speaker, Professor Taufik, Director, South Asian Institute of Policy and Governance, North Asian Institute of Policy, North South University, Taka. Ladies and gentlemen, who are here physically and with us virtually from across the nation and abroad. On behalf of Fazil Ali College, I would like to express my sincere gratitude and welcome you all to this first annual international conference organized by Research and Development Committee, which is sponsored by ICCSR New Delhi. On the team, India's extended neighborhood, converging interests. It is my hope that this conference would be able to achieve its objective in providing an effective forum for academicians, researchers, and social scientists to advance knowledge towards better understanding among the neighboring countries. While warmly welcoming you all to this great academic conference, I take this time to express my deepest gratitude to the organizing committee and to the ICCSR New Delhi and Director of Higher Education Nagalen for sponsoring this program. Although we try our best to be professional, on behalf of Fazil Ali College, please accept our apologies should there be inconveniences that occur before, during, and after the event. I wish you a very productive conference, an exciting and encouraging discussions, and exchange of knowledge so that together we can anticipate a future of groundbreaking knowledge and a research for humanities. We look forward to having a successful conference and we hope that all the attendees enjoy and benefit from this conference. Thank you very much. Now, um, we have, besides our paper presenters, we have a few invited speakers. Some are not able to join us physically, but for those who are here today, Fazil Ali College and the Research Development Cell would like to show a small token to remember us when, we leave, when you leave this college. So now I call upon the presenta presentation committee First, uh, I would like to call Professor Tamjan Susan to come to my left and kindly accept the small token. Uh, he is the Director, Research and Development Cell, Nagaland University. He has many publications in peer-reviewed articles and he is a prominent sociologist. Thank you, sir. Next, I call upon Dr. Likasi Sangdam. He is also from the Department of Political Science, Nagaland University. Please come forward. He has many publications and his PhD is on the topic Naga politics, its changing dimensions. Next, I call upon Dr. Tananjay Tripathi. 
Associate Professor and Chairperson, Department of International Relations, Faculty of Social Sciences. Please come forward, sir. South Asian University, Delhi. Next, I call upon Mohan S. Rana, Associate Lecturer, Department of Environmental and Life Sciences, Shiropsi College, Royal University of Bhutan. I also would like to call a special, special uh, participant here, and that is the lady wife of Mr. Mohanes Rana, Madam, Madam Tanka Maya Karki. Kindly come forward and accept our token of gratitude for being present here today. I would also like to remind the House that uh, just one day, uh, day before yesterday, we had an online meeting with one of the colleagues of Mr. Mohan S. Rana, that is Dr. Dentob Zirin. And we had a very productive meeting where we have uh, unofficially decided to collaborate, the Fazal Ali College, to collaborate with uh, Surabsi College, Royal University of Bhutan. We look forward to more interactions with you and your colleagues. Next, I would like to call upon Dr. David L. Beatty. He is also a scientist from the Botanical Survey of India, Eastern Region, Shillong. Next, uh, I call upon Professor Atungo Ovong, who is the Professor and Head, Department of Sociology and Academic Coordinator for Azadika Amrit Mahutsav, Nagaland University. I also call upon Dr. Akam Longjari, co-founder and publisher of the Morong Express. He has been involved in people's movements in areas of human rights, just peace, and reconciliation. He has a master in conflict transformation from Eastern Mennonite University, USC, and he has completed PhD from the University of New England, New South Wales, Australia. Sorry, I missed out one very important personality here. Um, may I call upon Professor Iman Kalyan Lahiri, who is the Professor and Head of Department, Department of International Relations, Jadavpur University, and Director, School of International Relations and Strategic Studies. Thank you all for being present here today. Now, uh, I give the time for the inaugural address to Professor Tamjin Susang. So please take your time. A very good morning to all of you who are present here in this very auspicious program. My beloved, Chairperson of today's program, respected principal, Dr. Wadi, my esteemed teaching faculties from across the nation and across the state who have come to engage in the exchange of education towards building a peaceful and developed progressive region in this Asian continent. My student friends and all the participants, indeed I'm privileged to be here in this program. I was told the Honorable Vice Chancellor of Nagaland University was supposed to be here, but because of his uh, engagement in other programs, he couldn't make it. However, 
our principal has requested me so i couldn't say no remembering that this is a college many years ago i was once a student and that i should not fail my college and because of that reason i have come over here well acknowledging all this i am also happy and i'm so encouraged to see the research and development cell of fazil ali college is taking this a very very encouraging and a very very productive initiatives to organize this kind of uh, international programs and while encouraging this as being a director of research and development consultancy cell in nagaland university i also felt it is my duty to share and also to express the possibilities of organizing more of this kind of uh, 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 programs because there are many many funding agencies in this country that are very enthusiastic and are very very devoted and constantly and steadfastly working for academic engagement and research in this very very beautiful country the department of science uh, department of biotechnology for instance the department of science and engineering research board for instance the indian council of agriculture research for instance the indian council of social science research for instance indian council of horticulture research for instance national mission on himalayan studies steiner which is called the science and technology intervention for north east india all these are very progressive and very very encouraging agencies funding agencies that funds for engagement in academic research and development i encourage once again the research and development cell of this fazil ali college to keep working on and keep uh, encouraging and organizing this kind of uh, programs steiner is very near to us it is located in jorhat and this steiner is sponsored by the ministry of donor which uh, ministry of donor government of india which aims for promotion of the people of the nordis the main call of the project the steiner project is to bring all relevant proven technologies to the people of northeast region and more particularly to farmers and artisan community so that the quality of your profession can be pushed through science and technological intervention i sincerely urge the rdc fazal ali college to keep constantly pursuing on this area i must say that ignorance is not an excuse but when the subject matter is not of my concern where i have no knowledge i may only confused the participants but and i will purposely confuse the participants because i am very confident that we have a lot of learned academicians from across the place to figure out under various themes and topics be it from international politics be it from economics be it from environment be it from sustainable developments be it from scientific approach and be it from cultural perspective the india's extended neighborhood converging interests is indeed a very very extensive and a very very large area that it needs a constant effort to understand the purpose and i want to share some few thoughts in this regard purposely to confuse the participants so that the resource person the various speakers will pave the way 
and will reason out with your empirical data. Under the neighborhood first policy of government of India, India is committed towards developing friendly and mutually beneficial relations with all its neighbors. Keeping this commitment steadfastly, India is an active development partner and is involved in several projects in its neighboring countries, particularly in Southeast Asia. The policy of neighborhood first also focus on creating mutual beneficial people-oriented regional framework for stability and prosperity of the region. One of the main principles of India's engagement with her neighbors is based on consultative, non-reciprocal, and outcome-oriented approach, which focus on delivering benefits like greater connectivity, improved infrastructure, stronger development corporations in various sectors, security, broader people-to-people -people contacts. At the backdrop of this policy, India has entered into various MOUs, Memorandum of Understanding. And one of such is with the members of the SAR countries with an objective to ensure a free flow of resource, energy, foods, goods, labor, and information across the border. When I say this, I already have conducted a research project way back in 2006, and it reminds me of how India was actively engaging in the neighborhood first the cross-border trade, which everyone must be quite aware of now, which is, in fact, a very, very popular uh, research area from the academic point of view, as well as for the bringing of the India closer to her neighboring countries. No development is possible without peace and tranquility in the region, and therefore, improving relations with neighbors to ensure peace and tranquility in this region is essential for realizing development agenda. Therefore, India maintained a constant political engagement with her neighbors through diplomatic dialogues. In the era of economic corporations, India also focused on enhancing threat ties with her neighbors in that India has participated and invested in SARC countries as a vehicle for development in the region. I can cite one example. One such example is Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, Nepal grouping for energy development. That is motor vehicles, water power management, and inter-grid connectivity. There are many more areas, such as disaster management, military and defense corporations, etc., etc., you name it. India is taking a very, very positive role, a very, very positive steps in trying to bring the concept of neighborhood first. While keeping a steadfast on the policy and objective of India's extended neighborhood, I wish to add a third dimension. That is, India can become a big brother to her neighbors. The concept may be debatable. The concept may be argued. But I still have a very optimistic that India can become a big brother to her neighbors. And this is possible, according to me, because the immediate neighbor or the immediate neighboring countries and beyond have in one way or the other has a great influence on them through the ancient Indian civilization. If not by culture or economy, definitely 
religion has a great impact in the, in, uh, the Asian continents. The India's neighboring regions, the Sarks, the ASEAN, and beyond. While saying this, while asserting this, I have just one sentence to justify that. Buddhism is the most important religion in Southeast Asia, being the second largest in this region after Islam, with approximately 205 million Buddhists today in Asia. Almost 38% of the world's Buddhist population resides in Southeast Asia. Thailand has the largest number of uh, Buddhist population with 95% of the people following Buddhism, where Bruni has the least with only 13%, no doubt. This community still there and have felt the presence across Southeast Asia. Now, early Buddhism was founded in India in 6th century BC by Siddhartha Gautama, who, became, who came to be known as Buddha, the Gautama Buddha. My point of argument is Buddhism has started in India, and that has spread across Southeast Asia, and there is the presence of this community. Islam is most widely practiced religion in Southeast Asia again with majority in Brunei, in Malaysia, and Indonesia, with approximately 242 million Muslims, that, is, that accounts to 42% of Southeast Asia's population. And most of them are Sunnis and follow the religious law. Islam is Brunei's and Malaysia's official religion and an important religion in Indonesia with 90% of the people following it. Southern Thailand is largely Muslim, along with most Southeast Asian minorities. Islam arrived in Southeast Asia, whether it is contentious or whether it is factual, in 13th century. And it is claimed that long after Hinduism and Buddhism have al already arrived in this Southeast Asia, many believe that it has traveled. Islam has traveled from India via the Middle East and some debate that it was brought by Muslim Chinese traders to this Southeast region. Now when Nepal is filled with Hindus, when majority of the Indian population is Hindus, and when major religions of the Southeast Asian countries are Buddhist and Islam, India is the only possible and probable leaders that can initiate for neighborhood first, what India aims to be. Having said all this, as I said, I have admitted it is not my subject, and therefore I will leave it to the expert who will dwell in rationalizing and in understanding the topic. But when we talk about neighbor, you can change your clothes, you can change your food, but you cannot change your neighbor. But neighbor alone is not sufficient for a healthy, peaceful, and progressive society. And therefore, neighborhood is essential. To see from an interactionist perspective, as a sociologist, the meaningful interaction of humans in the region, the activity of the people, the mutual corporations and activities of the people can only lead the region to a greater height. And it is because of that 
reasons, India has started to initiate the policy of neighbor first. I want to come back to the first sentence that I said, research and development, cell of Fazal Ali College. There will be a lot of programs and projects. Indeed, Act East policy is one of the initiative of this neighbor first. Many researchers, many funding agencies, they are willing to fund for that. ICSSR is more than willing to fund for undertaking research programs. The number of agencies that I've said, they are willing, they are willing to fund for research. It is only we who have to avail the opportunities. I congratulate the college administrations, the research and development cell of Fazal Ali College, the staff, the student community for bringing this mega step of organizing an international program. And I warmly extend my warm welcome to all the international friends and also people from different places across the country who have come taking a lot of troubles to participate in this program. God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you, sir, Professor Tamjan Susang, for the inaugural address for throwing open the conference to the plethora of possibilities on the converging interests of India's extended neighborhood. And also, we are in the firm belief that as the Director of Research and Development Cell, Nagaland University, you will continue to support us for further research and such other conferences. Now, our keynote theme address will come to us online from Professor Hawk, BHD Chair, Department of Political Science and Sociology, Director, South Asian Institute of Policy and Governance, North-South University, Dhaka, Bangladesh. Sir, kindly take your time. Chairperson of this inaugural session, Dr. Ronald Ulma, Head of Department English for the College. All the participants of this conference, I am grateful to the organizer for inviting me to give the keynote address of this inaugural ceremony. A special thanks to Dr. Ben Trin Thun Patton, co convener of the conference for getting me connected with this initiative. Before I start the keynote presentation, I would like to give a small introduction of my university and the institute. So I am representing the North-South University, which is the first private university in Bangladesh, and also now the topmost university, according to the Times Higher Education ranking, among all the public and private universities of the country. And I am also representing the South Asian Institute of Policy and Governance. I'm working there as a director. And this institute is basically an academic and research institute based on uh, the different academic programs and kind of a competitive research on South Asia. So we have a uh, specialized master's program on public policy and governance, master's in public policy and governance for South Asian students. And especially we get the students who are from civil service of Bangladesh, Nepal, Sri Lanka, Bhutan, and also sometimes we get Southeast Asian students also. Uh, we do have another master's program, executive master's in policy and governance for South Asian and Bangladesh students. And we do lots of research on South Asia. So we have a special uh, uh, kind of a expertise on 
South Asian policy and governance and our partnership with different universities in this region and also especially with India is now expanding uh, very rapidly. So we have a very close cooperation with Data Institute of Social Science uh, in the Indian Institute of Management, Ahmedabad, and CSGS Delhi, and many others. And I'm so happy that now we have some uh, kind of a partnership that we are getting with Fazalani College in Nagaland. And I hope that we will have a formal collaboration in research, uh, student and faculty exchange program with the college in coming days. Um, so with that uh, introductory note, I will now go with uh, my presentation. Can you please share the slide? And uh, I will not take probably more than 30 minutes. I hope I can bear it. Uh, so, um, is the slide is coming here. Yeah. Okay. So, I, my presentation will basically I will be using slide to uh, save the time. And the purpose is uh, the way that I have uh, designed the presentation that I will be starting with some uh, just uh, introductory remarks on the concept of India's extended neighborhood and then we'll talk a little bit about also the Northeast and uh, what are the role that we are expecting the Northeast uh, for this extended neighborhood concept and, and as I also representing Bangladesh I can also I would like to talk a little bit about Bangladesh India relationship and uh, some of the uh, the kind of achievements and also the challenges that we have seen in the last 50 years. And then I will be coming with uh, concluding remarks on uh, the Indo-Pacific and also other kind of the regional initiatives that we are seeing in this region. And then we'll be talking about a little bit that what the regional uh, kind of a collaboration uh, can be headed towards. So that is the general framework of my uh, presentation. So if we just uh, now come to the uh, this uh, okay the definition of extended neighborhood concept. Uh, and you see that uh, this uh, extended neighborhood is basically uh, generally uh, refers to the countries and the regions that are geographically close to India or have significant political, economic, and cultural ties with the country. So it includes Middle East, it includes Central Asia, and also Southeast Asian nations. So uh, India, like a big country, it has immediate neighbors, like the South Asian neighbors, and then it has also the extended neighbors. And the need for a coherent extended neighborhood policy stems from India's growing economic and the strategic importance, which broadens its interest beyond South Asia's borders. And that we are seeing uh, in a very uh, comprehensive manner for the last couple of decades. The vision of an extended neighborhood involves power projection by India, be it hard power, military, or an economic projection, or be it soft power, like cultural and, and ideational strands. The extended neighborhood has become the conceptual umbrella for India, and it is our to the eastwards, southwards, northwards, and westwards. And I miss that some of the, some have I have called it an omnidirectional 360 degree vision of the opportunities available to uh, India outside South Asia. So if you look into the map, I will be using uh, several maps in this presentation to, because since I'm not uh, present there physically, so probably uh, looking into the maps will be more easier to explain my uh, arguments and observations. So this is a map of India's extended neighborhood that we see that is uh, West Asia, and then also is Central Asia, and also uh, Southeast Asia. If you look into the West Asian kind of a, uh, regional engagement of India, and especially the Middle East, then uh, we'll be seeing that uh, the first uh, mentioning of this uh, loop West policy came into 2005 when the Indian uh, former Prime Minister Manmohan Singh announced this uh, policy and basically it signaled India's widening space of economic and strategic cooperation. And current Prime Minister of India Narendra Modi also has further reinforced this outlook by concentrating on three key areas, the Arab Gulf states, Israel and Iran. 
So cooperation with uh, Indian Western Asian neighbors have generally been contained to the realm of trade, energy security, and safety of the Indian diaspora in the region. And know that there is a huge Indian diaspora, especially in the uh, Gulf states. In addition to this, India has actively promoted its culture and educational systems in the region, especially focusing on cooperation and exchange. So this has been a concentrated effort in pursuit of bolstering India's soft power in the area, particularly by assisting in human resource development in the Gulf states. If we now look into this uh, uh, Central Asia-centric uh, policy of uh, India, that regional engagement in the Central Asia, it came basically from a historical background that the Silk Road uh, basically provides the historical foundation on which India-Central Asia relationships are built. And this is a thousands years old uh, kind of relationship. And as, the, uh, as India's economy has grown, India has increasingly sought to diversify its energy suppliers and Central Asian states have been instrumental in this regard. And as a result, we have seen that India has developed the Connect Central Asia policy, which seeks to strengthen ties between it and the region. And current Prime Minister Narendra Modi visited all five states in 2015 as the first Indian head of state. And so far, India has signed several agreements and MUs relating to defense and closer relations with uh, countries in the region. Now, if we come to the, the third segment of, of this uh, uh, extended neighborhood policy, then it comes there in the Southeast Asian countries. And the regional engagement of India from Southeast Asian perspective, is, uh, perspective basically ties with uh, multifaceted dimensions, uh, not only economy, not only kind of uh, energy security, but also religion, language, uh, customs, mythologies, folklore, and also arts. And as our, uh, my previous speaker was talking about the uh, uh, importance of Buddhism also in Southeast Asia and also this part of South Asia. So this also is all played, religion, culture, economy, uh, historical trade relationship, all played an important role between Southeast Asia and India. Yeah. And uh, this has uh, the economic and security ties uh, between India and India. As participating in joint and improving rail and air connectivity between and the as an energy buyer in perspective of, uh, in this perspective of, of our policy. So now if we look into the uh, India's Eastern as I just type to portray uh, uh, it like this and the strategic cons uh, constraint, we will be finding that India's northeastern region and the Bengal, such as the in the context, and the geographical opportunity of the states at the Bengal and Amaha and Asia, is a gateway to Southeast Asia. Unfortunately, Northeast and Bay of Bengal region both suffer, suffer, suffer from underdevelopment and instability which constrains India's foreign policy with. And in this respect, Bangladesh has emerged as a key state partner that is uh, Bangladesh of it will not be tonal emergency.
relationship. So, um, especially uh, in the in their role in the liberation of Bangladesh in 1971, and India was India was the first uh, or one of the first countries after probably Bhutan to recognize Bangladesh and establish uh, diplomatic relations in 1971. So support of government and people of India during Bangladesh's liberation war, including hosting 10 million Bengali refugees, which created a strong bond between the two countries. And two countries have shared history of civilization, culture, and society. So after 50 years of independence of Bangladesh, this relationship is now standing on a stable, warm, and mature place, but definitely with some issues. So geographically, if you see that uh, Bangladesh is surrounded almost entirely by its neighbor India. So it calls is for, for, for me. with a very narrow land of uh, connectivity. And this also comes at some point that uh, Northeast India, in a way also Bangladesh locked. Because in between Bangladesh, basically divided uh, Northeast India to with the rest of the, uh, the mainland India. So this is, this is the uh, kind of a places where both the countries probably need each other to uh, develop and also uh, fulfilling their geopolitical interests. Uh, I'll not. I'll just show some of the pictures here. The 1971 War of Liberation and part of uh, Bangladesh. I'm sure that you can identify the people who have been here. So can you please move the slide? Uh, yeah. yeah, and then um, you can see that there are um, the pictures um, where. Bangabundu with Indian President Prime Minister in Delhi on 10 January 1972 on his way to Dhaka after his release from Pakistan jail. And also uh, there are some uh, uh, historical photos with, uh, with Bangabundu with Indira Gandhi and uh, these are the uh, uh, symbols and also kind of a proven uh, uh, history of very strong bond of these uh, two nations and Bangladesh uh, as a state is still very grateful the role India played for the liberation of war and of its independence. Uh, so if you now come to the Bangladesh India relations in terms of uh, priorities, and again I will be going very quickly and with some uh, kind of a, um, a maps. So first uh, uh, kind of a, uh, priority ideas are connectivity and the connectivity also related with rail connectivity, road connectivity, water connectivity, and air connectivity. And we are seeing that in last 15, 20 years, there are lots of progress have been made in terms of uh, connectivity between Bangladesh, and especially with uh, Northeast India and also the uh, West Bengal and the other part of the uh, closing border of uh, Bangladesh. So um, we will be seeing that there are already some ongoing development projects uh, like 10, I have mentioned here. If you look into the map, I'm not going to uh, explain all of these uh, uh, projects, but this Akhaura, Agotola, Rail Link, or this Purimari, uh, Chandra Banda Rail Link, these all are now in the, either in the, uh, the work is now in progress or in the planning process. Mm -hmm. And we are seeing that uh, this is uh, very much helpful also. If you look into the next map, yeah, yeah you'll be finding that uh, this connectivity of Rail Link will help a lot to uh, get with the uh, Northeast with the rest of India. And uh, if it is ultimately being implemented in the long run, 
uh, the, both the uh, nations as well as the region, especially Northeast region, will be uh, very much uh, uh, benefited economically. Uh, because of shortage of time, I am not uh, going in, it, uh, <coughs> in details. And if you look into the road connectivity, there are also lots of uh, kind of uh, new plans, programs, and projects are going on. Already, my previous speaker he rightly mentioned about uh, uh, BPIN, Bangladesh, uh, Bhutan, India, uh, Nepal, uh, kind of a uh, project that uh, for motorcade and other kind of the connectivity. And Bangladesh also decided that, uh, to allow India to use Chattogram and Mongla seaports. And it allows the landlocked Assam, Meghalaya, and Tripura states to access sea trade routes to Chattogram and Mongla ports. And according to this arrangement, routes that reach Chattogram and Mongla seaports will be transported on four road routes to Agotola, uh, Dauki, Sukargandi, and Srimanpur. So these are the kind of uh, things that. Uh, uh, the planning uh, process are now going on. If you look into uh, the water transit routes to Northeast India uh, through Bangladesh and also the routes in place in this map, you find that uh, uh, these are very well planned kind of uh, initiatives and uh, it is taking very long time to implement these things because of some genuine reasons. I will come to that uh, point probably at the later stage of the discussion. Uh, but uh, as a uh, kind of a regional connectivity plan, this is very comprehensively been uh, done. So probably in the next uh, 10, 15, 20 years, we'll be seeing some real significant changes uh, through this connectivity planning and uh, policy implementation. Uh, Waterways connectivity is also a kind of a, uh, uh, a very important uh, discussion policy topic between the two countries. And we are seeing that there are uh, discussion on passenger movement and tourism using coastal, coastal shipping, coastal uh, river ports, and also there are uh, proposed ongoing projects related to uh, other kind of the uh, waterway, especially the multi-purpose uh, terminals going on. The air connectivity already uh, existing and also is now more, uh, uh, we are seeing that more uh, intensive uh, partnership is going on. I have used here one uh, uh, connectivity map uh, where it has been shown that our mainland in India uh, will uh, use the sea routes uh, through Indo Bangladesh Protocol. Um, so, if it has been implemented, then even not only through railway, not uh, road, but also by the waterway, the, the two nations, especially the, the western part of India and also the northeast can be well connected for uh, moving goods and also um, other kind of the trade will be very much possible. Now coming to the uh, one other important issue other than, uh, other than connectivity is trade and investment and uh, Bangladesh India trade scenario. Uh, we have a very long trade relationship and uh, business relationship and if you but uh, the problem is uh, the, the trade imbalance is very much high um, and understood also as a generally understood that India has a big country, it's a very big industrial uh, kind of units and Bangladesh uh, needs lots of uh, products from India and uh, but this is also becoming a little bit challenging issue over the time uh, because uh, if you look into the recent figure just want to show you that uh, up to in 2021-22, the figure shows that uh, Bangladesh imported almost like 15 billion dollar uh, US dollar uh, worth of product from India, uh, but uh, could export uh, less than two billion dollars. So this uh, trade imbalance is a big issue, uh, but it's also a, a, a economic uh, constraint for Bangladesh when it comes to Bangladesh China. Uh, trade relationship also because the highest trade imbalance now Bangladesh has, like many other South Asian countries, is with China. So this is a common uh, problem for a country like Bangladesh. Uh, I'm sure that all other many other South Asian countries also face the same problem. There are uh, uh, other trade and investment uh, related uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, issues which we are facing that uh, uh, related with our. Uh, Utilizing especially the opportunities under SAFTA. 
South Asian free trade agreement, which uh, has not been uh, properly implemented yet. And we have also some challenges, especially the product diversification, product standardization, uh, especially uh, there are challenges like lack of infrastructure and the land code, and also inadequate physical facilities at the land custom stations of India. And there are, uh, from Bangladesh side, there are concerns about tariff and non-tariff barriers which are imposed in many cases of Bangladeshi products and also some port restrictions for some ports. So, some new initiatives are there uh, between these two countries like Border Hub and also a review has been done on the establishment of expert group on trade related <coughs> measures. And also uh, some initiations have been, uh, uh, have been done on the comprehensive economic partnership I will go very quickly with the other sectoral cooperation. Bangladesh India having uh, both are having a very strong cooperation between border and security issues. So we have joint border uh, boundary working group and defense exchange going on. There are coordinated border management plan, and also there is a um, kind of a partnership going on in new economy and maritime cooperation. So there are uh, another uh, sectoral area where uh, both the countries are uh, engaging uh, very strongly, that is power and energy sector. So almost uh, 1,160 megawatt power is now imported from India at, at present. And there is also 50-50 joint venture of 1,320 megawatt coal for, uh, fire power plant in Rampal, which project is now going on. So Bangladesh imports power from Tripura and also export internet bandwidth uh, uh, to uh, Tripura. Uh, so in the case of the power, there are some uh, successes of cooperation, but there are more ways to see that how the both countries uh, can forward in future. Uh, there are, uh, we already talked about cooperation in the water resources, so uh, joint river commissions working with the countries and cooperation in flood warning and management are also going on. And definitely consular culture and other uh, cooperations are also uh, very active in the uh, last couple of decades. Uh, if we now come to the uh, discussion on this multilateral and regional engagement of the two countries, we we'll find that both countries are founder members of SARC and BIMSTEC, even though um, SARC is uh, almost like a kind of a trade initiative. If I uh, is a little bit complicated, uh, it's not working for and functioning. And BIMSTEC is also could not take off properly. Uh, so Bangladesh uh, has a uh, huge concern to see that these regional initiatives are uh, getting momentum. Uh, both the countries are party of SAFTA, the South Asian Free Trade Agreement. Uh, both Bangladesh and India shares the aspiration to join ASEAN. Uh, Bangladesh is active partner of China's Belt and Road Initiative, and uh, which is a, a huge concern probably from India's side, because India has not signed it yet. And Bangladesh supported India for its membership in UN Security Council and requested for India's support during the IOR chairmanship. And Bangladesh and India are party to BBIL motor vehicle agreement, which I have uh, yeah, already mentioned. So even in the multilateral regional uh, forum also, uh, both the countries, uh, they are uh, working very closely in, in the most of the cases. Uh, this is the BBIL uh, route. I'm not going to, uh, because this is a very uh, important uh, initiative from Bangladesh side, we want to see that even Nepal and Bhutan get uh, connected with Bangladesh and they can use our ports so that Bangladesh economy can flourish and post, uh, two countries can also uh, uh, get benefited out of it. Um, if we now talk a little bit uh, about the Bangladesh India interdependency, we will be seeing that uh, Bangladesh is considered as a big destination of Indian goods and services. And India receives a significant number of tourists from Bangladesh as well as patients from Bangladesh. Uh, many of the medical uh, uh, kind of the patients, they uh, would like to go to Indian hospitals for better treatments. And Bangladesh is also uh, an important destination for Indians for white collar jobs and also a source of evidence that uh, in our governments and other industry. Um, India, uh, from the other side, if we the Indian dependence on Bangladesh, that India depends on 
presence of Bangladesh for T20 and smooth communication with non-Eastern states and connectivity to Chattogram Bangladesh seaports and especially last 15-20 uh, years uh, Bangladesh actively helped India to solve the security problem of the Northeast India and that helped in many ways to uh, save the revenue and also the budget uh, for India's uh, security expenditure. Mm -hmm. And Bangladesh also is known as the most trusted friend of India in the international forum. Uh, India also wants Bangladesh to join hands with India for countering and contain China and to curb China's growing influence in this region, especially. So that's again one expectation, and uh, there is this is the elephant in the room where uh, both the countries sometimes have some convergences, but sometimes also have uh, divergences uh, in terms of uh, opinions and ideas. Uh, now, I very quickly will just touch about Bangladesh North East Asia, North East India relationship. And if you look into the history, that uh, before 1947 partition of the uh, subcontinent Bangladesh and North East region of India, along with the Bay of Bengal region, was geographically uh, was a common socio politically coherent and an economically integrated. Till 1930, the region was economically thriving and acted as great business corridors between this uh, region and Asia and Europe. Uh, during World War II, the Bangladesh and the Northeast region uh, became a war zone between British and Japanese forces. Uh, but the partition disconnected Northeast India from East Bengal, which is the Bangladesh now, and resulting in a sharp economic decline of the, the whole region. So, emergence of Bangladesh as an independent country in 1971 and subsequent rise of India and China now have revived the prospects of this region. And why I'm saying this? Because now you'll be finding that even, uh, even during this uh, recent visit of a Japanese Prime Minister, uh, when uh, Minister uh, Mr. Ishida was in Delhi, he also mentioned about the prospect of this uh, the connectivity. So, since 2010, the gaining importance of Indo Pacific strategy added a new dimension to the Bangladesh North East uh, region relationship. Uh, during this bilateral discussion, uh, which has happened uh, this week between the Japanese Prime Minister and the uh, Indian Prime Minister, a special emphasis was given on the plans to work on infrastructure projects to link Bangladesh and India's North. So Japan unveiled a $75 billion plan for a free and open in the Pacific to work with countries in the region on avoiding their traps, building infrastructure, and enhancing maritime and air security. So you can understand that from a uh, geopolitical point of view and geoeconomic point of view, both Bangladesh and Northeast uh, region of India uh, becoming very important from regional powers as well as uh, global powers. So, if you look into uh, the Bangladesh's approach to Northeast region of India and in the Pacific, you'll be finding that uh, we have a um, guided principle in our foreign policy by Bangabundu uh, Shekhuji Rama, and which is the friendship to all and malice to uh, now. And uh, our uh, the policy towards the uh, Northeast and, and also the Indo Pacific is. To reach out and get connected to Asia and also definitely to Europe somewhere, but not to pursue any defense related aspirations or join any defense or security group. And that's a kind of unfair, probably, uh, difference between the foreign policy position uh, between the two countries. And Bangladesh would like to engage with any initiative based on principles of mutual trust and respect, securing win win outcome equitable sharing of benefits, transparency, and open regionalism. And it wants to harness complementarity as opposed to mutually exclusive competition and would like to focus on mega infrastructure and development. <coughs> so that's basically the major thrust of our Bangladesh in terms of uh, sub-regional or regional integration. I have quoted here uh, one of the statements by our uh, Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina uh, during her speech in 18 SAR summit in, uh, in Nepal 2014, she mentioned that physical connectivity is important in ensuring overall peace, progress, and stability across South Asia. 
So multimodal physical connectivity links territories, communities, etc. And Bangladesh approaches connectivity in a wider context. So she was uh, mentioning that we believe in connecting ideas, knowledge, technology, culture, people, road, rail, air, movement of goods, services, and investment. So it is a more a kind of a broader uh, kind of a relationship that Bangladesh wants to see that through connectivity will be achieved and uh, uh, reached. Uh, I'm not going to detail out um, at the time. And now, very quickly, with uh, some of the challenges that we are facing. There's a uh, bilateral relationship like any other countries, any neighbors, uh, they have issues. Uh, so, one of the contesting issues between Bangladesh and uh, India is the hostile borders. Bangladesh India share one of the most densely populated borders in the world, spanning almost uh, 4,000 uh, kilometers. And this region is one of the deadliest in the world with India's border security forces killing nearly 2,000 Bangladeshi citizens since the later independence. So cross-border uh, kind of a migration, that is a uh, kind of important issue from the Indian perspective. And India is uh, informing Bangladesh that uh, uh, this is uh, something that they want to see that uh, Bangladesh address. And this is, uh, is largely happened because of, you know, that um, uh, the people uh, visiting family members from one side of the border to other, sometimes cattle trading, and also in some cases the job opportunities. But till date, the border killing remains a contentious issue between both countries, and Bangladesh uh, always uh, tried to mention this in the bilateral meetings that uh, this needs to be addressed uh, seriously. The second contentious issue or uh, challenging issue between uh, the two countries is water security. As I mentioned in my previous one of the slides, that uh, we share almost 54 common rivers. In most of the cases, Bangladesh is lower riparian state to India. And both countries have been at crossroads on issues of equitable water management. And the two major water disputes are the Tista River dispute and Congest uh, uh, River dispute. And to date, no treaty has been signed to solve the Tista water sharing dispute. Although both, although both countries were close to engage agreement, but the West Bengal's uh, 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 a kind of opposition uh, uh, could not make it happen. Uh, so Bangladesh is worried about this thing because now the news are coming that if there are more plans of uh, making barrage of this type, which will, uh, which will uh, withdraw more water from the this time Bangladesh will face more problems in coming. We have the Bangladesh uh, Water Sharing Treaty, but, uh, which is a success story in many ways, even though there are some concerns from Bangladesh. And that is going to expand in, uh, in 2026, and uh, we need to again uh, extend that demand beyond 2026. So, this is uh, some of the challenging issues that uh, Bangladesh and India, both the countries, are facing. Bilateral uh, trade is one with the state imbalance, we already mentioned, I'm not going to iterate out again. So this is also something that Bangladesh would like to see that uh, our products are going more to Indian markets and uh, uh, so that the balance, uh, the trade imbalance uh, come to uh, narrower or uh, uh, come to a rational level. Okay, so the future uh, challenges between uh, Bangladesh and India uh, for the relationship. So uh, in many ways, Bangladesh is a little bit uh, uh, concerned about India's changing domestic political dynamics and the rise of ultranationalism. And especially, again, there is another elephant in the room uh, that uh, the Citizenship Act, Bangladesh is very worried about it. And uh, there are anti Bangladesh rhetorics in many ways uh, by the politicians, uh, especially before the elections are coming. So, those are the things that. Uh, uh, so that the friendly country would uh, need to uh, see that how we can uh, solve those things. Another uh, important concern from India side is uh, China's growing interest in South Asia, uh, especially in the Bay of Bengal. And Bangladesh uh, having a very uh, close relation with China, no doubt, and uh, Bangladesh's uh, cooperation with China is uh, making, uh, is getting more stronger day by day, and that's probably a concern for India from a geopolitical point of view. 
Uh, another future challenge is the new emerging security alliances, uh, like both in the Pacific and the I will be in my last closing uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, slides, I will be touching that up. And uh, water sharing that I've already talked about. And also, you know, that Bangladesh is graduating from LDC, and that may uh, include some technical complexity in the country. And area of future collaboration, I, I have presented here a few of the points, like uh, we can have a sustainable arrangement for river basin management and water resource development. And we can have more collaboration for energy security. And, and even we can uh, add Nepal Bhutan with that. Bangladesh would like to see that we also import Nepali uh, electricity or the electricity from Bhutan, but uh, then we need uh, uh, kind of a uh, India's uh, assistance because the, the transmission would use a uh, Indian land and territory. And uh, we would like to see also regional connectivity be, uh, beyond South Asia, including Bangladesh inclusion in trilateral highway, and also diversification of products and services. And uh, one of the areas that Bangladesh wants to see India's support and assistance is the sustainable resolution of going issue. You all know that 1.1 million local refugees are now sitting in Bangladesh and it's a huge burden. So Bangladesh wants to see that India puts its uh, uh, political influence and economic influence on Myanmar uh, for, uh, for uh, get them equipped uh, to the Rohingya investigation. So these are the, some of the way forwards that uh, removing this perception among the people to be the solid friendship between two countries. We can jointly develop a new model, model of relation based on mutual trust, confidence, and mutual benefit and purposes, and effectively addressing issues, concerns both countries in a win win context. Um, and Bangladesh also would like to see that we are reducing dependency, especially the economic and trade dependency on India, and making more balanced trade, and also developing a long term Indian policy and exchange of expertise and aiming at collective development and promoting people-centric relationships. So now I come to uh, the, uh, the discussion about and the concluding, my concluding thoughts on this India's Nepal. So what we are seeing that uh, there is a global change going on. So the two centuries of Western domination of Asia, first under this Pax Britannica and then uh, then under Max American are coming to an end, and probably this uh, uh, Russia Ukraine war has expedited the whole process. And we are seeing that uh, we are seeing that geopolitics of the Pacific is at historical inflection point due to rise of ultranationalism, illiberal democracies, and weakening of multilateralism and great power rivalry. So, converging of interests among diverse stakeholders in Asia on future world order is yet to emerge. Even though we are seeing so many emerging new alliances are coming, uh, including uh, BRICS and uh, also the other other kind of uh, uh, alliances. But uh, it is not very clear till now that uh, how this uh, multipolar world order will be look uh, will be look like. So we'll have to also uh, probably accept and understand that economic dependency of many Asian countries on China is a reality. Uh, uh, so that's a kind of a uh, situation in the bilateral relation of many Southeast Asian countries and South Asian countries in China. And we need new initiatives to need, uh, need to be critically analyzed, contextually understood mm -hmm. and aligned with national interests and long term relationships. So, the pandemic and this uh, this war, uh, the Russia-Ukraine war, recently have, have accelerated the argument for integration of some regional economies and establishment of regional supply chain, even between India and China. So it has been proven that uh, uh, we need to have more regional cooperation uh, if we want to see that this under uninterrupted regional supply chain. Is but different centric initiatives are generating controversy and divergence. Uh, so India's immediate neighbors, especially the South Asian neighbors, they, are, they want to have a good relations with both India and China. 
and they are not interested to take a side during this uncertain time of big power. And there is a, if you think about the situation in Nepal, Sri Lanka, uh, Bhutan, or Bangladesh, so this is the kind of a reality that uh, these countries, they want to have a very good relation with India, economically, uh, geopolitically, geoeconomically, and uh, in other ways, but also they want to have a strong partnership with China. So this IPS and BRI, the both these, uh, these initiatives, the potentiality of creating regional convergence as well as divergence. So it will be depending on the, the leaders and the foreign policies of the region, how they will uh, uh, they will uh, address these two policies in the South Asia and also Southeast Asia. So we we suggested that the regional policies and leaders should try to avoid being the battleground of big power rivalry, and this should be and this would be probably a litmus test of leaders and foreign policy of this region amidst the growing competition and deepening mistrust between major powers. So this is a challenge for coming days, uh, India's, India's neighborhood policy, as well as the other kind of the, uh, kind of the emerging uh, uh, policy there. In my last slide, I have tried to show a map of the countries who are involved in BRI, and then also in the Pacific, and then also a emerging kind of alliance that are coming as the Eurasian uh, thing. And if you look into the map uh, very carefully, um, you'll be finding that the common ground of the map, these uh, this three cycles, circles, uh, they have uh, a kind of a common ground that uh, is part of, that, that part of the map is also been involved in BRI in the Pacific Eurasia together. And that's basically India and other South Asian countries and Southeast Asia and also China. So the future of the world economy, world politics uh, will be basically uh, evolved in this uh, the middle ground. And uh, this will be depending on how this region will flourish and how this region will avoid the big power rivalry will be depending on the leaders of the region and also the foreign policy that they are wanting to question. So, as a kind of a uh, regional, uh, India's regional neighbors, we would like to see that a peaceful and a coexistent kind of a middle ground where India, China, South Asia, Southeast Asia, all the countries will have a shared future uh, in the coming days. With that uh, positive and optimistic note, I am concluding my speech. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you, you Hulk, Hulk, for that sort of on the challenges, the opportunities, and also the future collaborations on the multifaceted connectivity between India and Bangladesh, as well as the neighboring states. It is unfortunate that you cannot be with us physically, but uh, we will look forward to more interactions with you in the future, online as well as physically. Thank you, sir. Now we will go on to session two. And as instructed by the RTC for those who joined us late, um, there will no be there won't be any serving of tea, water, and red tea inside the hall. But if you wish, you can always go out to the lobby. It is right in front of us in the corridor, and you can always help yourself. If there be any need besides this, kindly communicate with the organizers and the uh, uh, student volunteers. As we move on to the next session, session one, I would also like to inform the participants that after the two team speakers of session one, there will be a photo session. And uh, all the participants are requested to kindly cooperate. And uh, another instruction from the technical team. For those paper presenters, once you come to the uh, 
lectern, kindly uh, speak nearer to the mic because there are two microphones here, one for the physical crowd and one will be transmitting to our online presenters. So Hello, Tess. Hello, Tess.
participants. I request all the participants to kindly come in. We will start the session. We have a very tight schedule.
¿no? Ok, let's get started with the next session. Uh, good morning, uh, distinguished personalities, respected uh, inaugural guests, Professor Tenjin Sosang, and uh, our keynote speaker who has joined online and Valedictory guest, our additional director and HOT, uh, higher education, concluding observer, Dr. Akam Longchari, and all the invited speakers and all the participants. And uh, all the participants here, as well as those who are joining us online. I welcome you all to the first uh, session of sub team speakers. So, uh, we have in this session, uh, I'll be moderating the session. We have two speakers. Our next speaker will be joining us uh, soon. Uh, we have uh, Dr. L. Imli Nichit Imchen, Assistant Professor, Department of Economics, Fazal Ali College as a rapporteur. Uh, the first speaker is Dr. Iman Kalyan Lahiri. He needs no introduction, actually, for uh, the students of international relations. He's a very renowned uh, academician. Uh, if you look at the uh, brochure, you will find his profile. Dr. Lahiri is currently the head of Department of International, uh, International Relations in Jadavpur University, Kolkata. He is also the General Secretary of the Jadavpur Association of International Relations, that is JAIR, and the Executive Editor of JAIR Journal of International Relations, which is uh, UGC CARE listed. He is the director of School of International Relations and Strategic Studies, Jadavpur University, and has been a visiting fellow at the University of South Carolina, USA, under summer, US Summer Institute program. Uh, he has authored many books and is interested in uh, uh, peace development and uh, uh, South Asian studies, Southeast and South Asian studies. He has also published uh, many articles in reputed journals. So uh, he will be speaking today uh, on the topic India's Act is Policy and the Chinese China Factor. So I first call upon him to kindly take the time. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm audible, I guess. So I'll be speaking on uh, India's extended neighborhood, and I thank very much Bobby and 
the Fazal Ali College for inviting me all the way and all the colleagues who are present here today, my friend Ananjay, and of course the students uh, who has made this con conference uh, possible. Now, as you know that we are discussing about extended neighborhood and in the morning two speakers has already talked about the idea of India's extended neighborhood. Now, basically to begin with, theoretically, uh, extended neighborhood, as far as India is concerned, is multidimensional and omnidirectional. Now, India's interests extend beyond its borders, its fixation on South Asia, Asia-centric notion of neighborhood can no longer be deployed as a useful analytical framework to evaluate India's regional diplomacy. Now, whether any governments led by BJP or by Congress party have woven the term extended neighborhood into their foreign policy formulations, and in doing so, they have responded to concern of Indian commentators in 1997 that India should break out of the claustrophobic confines of South Asia. Now, these are the common things that we know, the regions within South Asia, the Indian subcontinent, the members of SARC represent India's immediate neighborhood. The regions beyond South Asia represent India's extended neighborhood. And India's extended neighborhood today, therefore, comprises of South Asia, Indo-Pacific, Southeast Asia, West Asia, and Central Asia, of course. And each of these neighborhood comes with its own opportunities and challenges as far as India is concerned. Now, the vision of extended neighborhood, it involves power projection, of course, by India, be it hard power, military, and economic projection to ought to be a soft power, cultural, and additional stance, as our keynote speaker has already mentioned in the morning, like Buddhism. The extended neighborhood has come from a conceptual umbrella of India, eastwards, southwards, northwards, westwards, amidst what some have called an omnidirectional 360 degree vision of the opportunities available to India outside South Asia. And here, basically, four concerns have so far been identified as underpinning India's extended neighborhood framework, namely trade, energy, security, and military concern. Now, India is holding the presidency of G20, as we all know, and the key word that is catching us all is Basudeva Kutumbakam. The entire world is, my, world is my family, which is coming from another sloka of Gita, which says, that is, the river may have its origin anywhere, but they are mixing or going only to the ocean. So you see that how Bay of Bengal is gradually becoming the hub of India's foreign policy decision-making ideas. Because Mahan, one of the geopolitical thinkers who once said, whoever has control over Indian Ocean has the control over the entire world. But Basudeva Kutumbakam is a guiding philosophy based on which India is working upon. And why it is working upon? Why this is the coinage of India while India is talking about G20? Because of the unique cultural geography of India. Our keynote speaker has talked about Buddhism in the morning, which he also linked with the neighborhood first policy of India, which is again giving us the understanding of socio-cultural nature of our immediate neighborhood. And this is because we all share a common prehistory. It's not like that. We don't have a history together. We have a common prehistory. Even we are talking about the rice ripping ceremony. The, the, Situation is same, and my uh, speaker from Bangladesh when he was talking about, because every 30, 40, 50 kilometers, the language may change, the dialects may change, but the culture never changes. And that is the essence India has taken over 
while discussing on very vital issues of extended neighborhood. The first is commonality. Commonality among all the nations. Because in Bengal, we are coming from West Bengal, we had a shared history with Afghanistan long back. Because Kabuli Wallace from Afghanistan used to come to Bengal to sell their goods during the winter seasons. The second is the uniformity that the India's extended neighborhood is having. Our relationship with the neighbor is more of understanding the changing nature of our neighborhood. And thus, we respect our neighbors as contemporary modern state. It is not like that we don't respect our neighbors. We have to respect Bangladesh. We know that in 1971, India played a very important role in Bangladesh liberation movement. But still today, we have to recognize them as a contemporary modern state. And people-centric shared prosperity. The relationship between governments are asymmetric in nature as far as uh, neighborhood policy of India is concerned. Now, positioning the neighborhood policy is again very difficult for India. But India sees it as internal in nature. Why? Because of the continuity of culture. Anything that connects is continuity. It is space-based connectivity between the countries, which India thinks today is also very important. Because sitting in Bangladesh, a speaker is giving keynote to us in Nagaland. This is connectivity. Anything, the internet, the net, this is connectivity. Development partnership, development program, and India is also having the grant-based, credit-based, institutional cooperation and mechanism. Mostly, it is ground-based. We rarely give credit-based opportunities to our neighbors, but it is ground-based. But, of course, sometimes it could be credit-based cooperation. And, of course, within this positioning of neighborhood policy, two things are very important. That is the internal and external security of India. But, you know, I just want to give a very simple example that how India swayed the mind of the neighbors and the extended neighbors during the COVID time. It is the vaccine diplomacy, which is vaccine, vaccine maitri, as government calls it. India is so it because the mind of very many millions of the stakeholders in the region, in the neighborhood and then the extended neighborhood during the COVID period. It's just a simple example we can have uh, right now in the post-COVID time, but there are several others too. Thus, as I've already mentioned, India's extended neighborhood, it involves Bimstek, it involves Actist, it involves Indo-Pacific, and you know that three key initiatives, that is the neighborhood, neighborhood first policy of India, the Actist policy, and the Indo-Pacific construct, this three important aspect of India's extended neighborhood. Then comes the West Asia. You know that in 2005, Prime Minister Manmohan Singh announced Look West policy. And it was the India's extension of economic hinterland and widening strategic cooperation. And Indian interests in Gulf have continued to be primarily focused on trade, energy security, and protecting the rights of the Indian diaspora in the area. India is actively promoting its culture and educational system in the area with focus on cooperation and exchange. Again in 2014, when Prime Minister Modi came into power, the broad outlines of India's Middle East strategy were well established. Instead of choosing a different direction, the new administration continued along with the same road, but reinforced the Look West policy by concentrating on three key areas, the Arab Gulf states, the Israel, and the Iran. Next comes the Central Asia. That is, the Silk Road provides the basic of the uh, history of India's relation with Central Asia. However, as the time progressed, India's ties to Central Asia continued to weaken, which is also apparent from the fact that India did not have any sizable post-independence policy aimed at Central Asia. In order to lessen its reliance on pipelines to Russia, Central Asia also thought about it, how to how it could supply energy to Asia's first rising countries, such as India and China. So thus, India came out with 
India's uh, connect Central Asia policy as a result of growing fascination with the region. Now, India's connect Central Asia policy was enhanced by Prime Minister Modi when he visited all the five countries in 2015, making him the first Indian uh, head of the state uh, to do so. Now, there are challenges too. India's neighborhood policy cannot just come out with opportunities. It is the connectivity versus neighborhood. Transport connectivity and logistics infrastructure. For example, when we are talking it or organizing this conference in northeastern region has remained neglected for a long. This has prevented the states from participating and benefiting from India's economic system, programs launched in the early 1990s. And you now, in years, agricultural produce often falls or fails to find the timely market leading to distressed selling uh, or of wastage. For instance, it takes about 10 to 15 days to transport spices from Gowati to Delhi and more than 25 days from Gowati to Mumbai. This is just an example. And a model share in northeastern region is skewed towards roadways, followed by uh, railways despite having a very good network of inland waterways. And now ac access to when we are talking about Chittagong port or Mongla ports. But we must have the accessibility uh, too. Now, if we cannot just increase or when you talk about the uh, regional connectivity, extended neighborhood policy, there exists the uh, L Cs, that is the land custom stations in Mizoram and Bangladesh. India tried for a very long time to operate through those stations. But most of the stations are closed today. And if it is closed for a very long time, people will again go for informal channels. What is happening in Calcutta, the trade between India and Bangladesh, the trade between Mizoram, the trade between the other states, northeastern states of uh, in difficult issue for India sometimes. And you know that talking about and the building of the infrastructure is very important. Because as a, again, to put an example, we have Andaman and Nicobar Islands. Andaman and Nicobar Islands is 100 kilometers. The last island of Indonesia is only uh, 100 kilometers, 115, 20 kilometers away from Andaman and Nicobar Islands. But if we build a port over there, we need business in the port. Building a port is nothing. Government can invest over there. Government has invested LCDs, but having business in those land custom stations in the ports remain very important today. Now there are challenges from Pakistan too. You see that as far as Jammu and Kashmir is concerned, most of the areas are occupied by Jammu and Kashmir. But if you see the, this Shashagao area, that is the upper part uh, of the map, this area, this is also becoming uh, nearly 150 glaciers are just originating from Shashgao area, which was given to China by Pakistan in 1963. As a result, what is happening today in the modern day world, when you're talking about extended neighborhood, the microchip chip warfare is the warfare of the time. And for making microchips, you need fresh water that is available in this particular position, which is now occupied by China. And there is a major debate if you see the newspapers that is coming out between China and USA. So this is the way we are getting disturbed repeatedly in these areas. Second important area, you see, the Chinese and the Nepalese railway links. We are talking about extended neighborhood policy, but by 2021, Lasha Kathmandu railway tracks will be built properly. And the purpose of the Buram and Yadong is also there. So these are the problems that is grasping, and we cannot just go out of these challenges when you talk about the India's neighborhood policy. The bigger competitive elements are apparent vis-a-vis -vis China in India's extended neighborhood. In terms of China and India's respective unilateral power projection, they are in their bilateral relations with each other countries, they are in their roles in the varied regional organizations operating there. Now, Sino-Indian extended co competition has been recognized by many Indian and Chinese commentators, even if the two governments publicly states win-win uh, situation 
or win-win economic cooperation. China alone the disputed Himalayan borderline is a problematic factor for India in its immediate neighborhood, further exacerbated by India's fear for Chinese encirclement within South Asia through China's strategic pro proxies like Bangladesh, Pakistan, and perhaps Nepal. So these are the problems we cannot just ignore right now. Now, uh, India shouldered more than more of the Indian Ocean. Meanwhile, China's blue water drive is bringing PRC further into the Indian Ocean and Western Pacific, into India's own extended neighborhood, and with it, rising Indian maritime concerns about China. Whereas India is starting to play a balancing role in South China Sea. It is increasing its maritime strength in the wider Indian Ocean region relative to China. Although China's link with Pakistan, Bangladesh, and to some extent Sri Lanka are conversely impacting within India's immediate maritime neighborhood. But uh, there are certain other issues which is very important for us, like G20. I just sum up because time is very limited, so I just don't want to continue it for very more. But G20. Now, China also hosted G20. India is hosting G20. India is having the presidency. Now, unlike China, India has not moved to host the G20 summit process at the leaders' level first. Second important thing is that India is concentrating too much on its past, while China has showcased their entire G20 process within their understanding of development. And the very important point that is important for us to understand that China and India are not, China is not a democracy per se, but India is connecting its development process with democracy. China is not doing so. So China is projecting as a nation in a very different way to the other countries of the world. While India is starting to play a balancing role in many of the areas, uh, it is very important for us to understand that how to count counter China in that way. Last but not the, it is also very important for us to understand that we are talking about soft diplomacy uh, in the modern day world order or even within the jurisdiction of G20, the meetings we are having for so far. Now, soft diplomacy, even our keynote speaker, sir, has mentioned about Buddhism. Now, you tell me, India is the land of Buddhism. We have forgotten Buddhism some 5,000 years back. So now we are reviving that, the soft power tendency about Buddhism. Yes, India played a significant role during Dal Dalai Lama's coming back to India. India played a very important role during 2008 when uh, the, the Tibetan pro uh, problem did emerge. But Buddhism, how can, we, can it sway the Central Asian countries when thousands and thousands of population is striving towards Islamization? So India has never thought of that. India has never thought of that. So process of understanding, it cannot be emotional in that way too. So extended neighborhood is important. But how to connect with our Central Asian neighbors? How to connect with Malaysia? How to connect with Indonesia? How to connect with Philippines? These are the important factors that India should uh, keep in mind. And the second important factor, as I have already mentioned, that every time we do not, do not need to connect our democracy with our development or our relationship with our extended neighborhood. Development has its own choice. Democracy has its own choice. So China and India, this perspective has to be analyzed repeatedly within the purview of understanding of our neighborhood policy. And of course, not, of course, Northeast India. In 2010, first time we organized a seminar when Shashi Tharoor came at Shillong, when he promised to have a railway link. Today is 2023. Only, I think, Nahal Lagoon railway link has been established, apart from the Assam, Assam area, or Arunachal. This railway tax has been built, but not operational. So our keynote speaker has also talked about the connectivity. But connectivity through which, that is very, very important for us to 
understand when you talk about ne neighborhood policy or extended neighborhood policy. Because from, from Jorhat to Magukchong, it took almost six hours yesterday, only 86 kilometers. Only 86 kilometers. Whereas in China, you go, you cover 250 kilometers within three hours. So the question of connectivity and development must to be, has to be reanalyzed. And Buddhism, as I've said, that is an important feature of India. That is a very, very important feature of Indian philosophy. But emotionally, we cannot just use Buddhism as a soft power understanding to have or to connect with the Central Asian countries because they will simply not understand it. So this is the time that India should repeatedly involve the local stakeholders because people are the most important part of understanding all of this connectivity. Because without people, connectivity is not possible. So government, wherever it is in the center, must understand that how to connect the people to give the continuity of this connectivity we are striving or trying to find for very long years. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Iman, for first of all, keeping conscious of the time. Secondly, uh, enlightening us on the China factor in uh, India's foreign relation. Uh, how China has been, uh, so to say, an impediment in our foreign policy initiative, in our security interests. I always used to wonder whether uh, the one that you have uh, premised that uh, it is not necessarily, it cannot be necessarily, may not be necessarily based on uh, democracy and uh, development. As uh, Thakur, uh, who, who sang the f freedom song, Where the Mind is Without Fear, I was wondering whether we can uh, have that kind of relations where uh, the, the world is not uh, broken down into fragments uh, uh, into a narrow fragmented walls, but where we can uh, find common interests and work in harmonious relation. Uh, if you have any questions or queries or comments, we will give time after the next speaker. We'll spare some time for uh, such queries. Uh, now, I would call upon uh, our next speaker, Dr. Uh, Lekase Sangtam, he is an assistant professor, senior assistant professor in political science and has uh, uh, worked on uh, uh, Look East policy and uh, uh, his area of interest are on Look East policy and uh, democracy with special focus to Northeast and Nagaland. He has published quite a number of uh, publications. Uh, he is going to speak on India's foreign policy paradigm shift towards neighborhood since 2014. Now I invite Dr. Likase to kindly take the time. Good morning, everyone. Respect the chairperson, my esteemed colleagues, the convener of this committee, the, this, uh, this conference, and a one person here. I'm very fortunate and privileged to take this time to deliver on the talk, the Indian, India's foreign policy paradigm shift towards neighborhood since 2014.
Joel can you please Yeah, in this line of diversity, if you look at the Indian, Indian people, we see the diversity in terms of race, in terms of uh, language, in terms of culture. There are so many multi-diversity exist in the Indian subcontinent. And that's what India is all about. When India framed her Indian foreign policy, all those things have been taken into account, and that's how we frame our own foreign policy. And today, if you look at the Indian foreign policy, John, is it to do with the battery or? Or can you just? Yeah. Or should I do it? Yeah, let me just, foreign policy is a policy pursued by a sovereign nations in dealing with other nations, designed to achieve her national interests among competing and conflicting interests of nations within the ambit of international law. It encompasses the tactics and the process by which a nation interacts with other nations in order to further its own interests, thereby creating its own persona or image in the international community. Foreign policy navigates and determines the nation's course of future in fulfilling fulfillment of her set goals and objectives. Foreign policy manifests the nation's core value and the principle on which the nation rests. The concept of India's foreign policy was conceived before her independence. The foreign policy of India of independent India was the reflection of her core values and principles. Accordingly, the following has been charted out as the main tenets of Indian foreign policy. One, the promotion of international peace and security. Second, friendly relations with other countries, respect for international law and international organizations like UN, peaceful settlement of international disputes. These principles have stood the test of time and are ingrained in the international law and India's foreign policy practice. Some of these principles are discussed below. Punch shield, mutual respect for each other's territorial integrity and sovereignty, non-aggression against each other, non-interference in each other's internal affairs, equality and mutual benefit, peaceful coexistence. Yeah, these principles of punch shield were later incorporated in the Bantan Declaration, non-alignment, and still guide the context of India's foreign policy, policy of non-alignment, policy of resisting colonialism, imperialism, racism, the peaceful settlement of international dispute, support to international, uh, UN, international law, and a just and equal world order. Now, if you look at the Indian foreign policy, that er this, till here, is where the Indian foreign policy have been pursuing it. But in, from 2018, uh, 2014, Modi-led India government came to power, and the moment this BJP government, BJP led NTA took over the government, a lot of changes have taken place in India. In fact, the core thing has, was already there, but it was he who literally took our image, they took the image of the India in a different, different label. Let me just uh, uh, read out this 
in the spirit of Vasudi uh, Vasudeva Kutumbakam, meaning the world is one family, or all living beings on earth are one family. Taken from the Mahapanishad and Vedic tradition to elucidate the country's global image or outlook. In one of the one occasion, the Ministry of External Affairs released a document, citizen-centric foreign policy, under which the major tenets or the core principle of India's foreign policy are mentioned during his days. I, let me quote the uh, Prime Minister. India is a great culture that is thousands of years old, a culture that has its own vibrant traditions and which encompass universal dreams. Our values and culture see divinity in every being and strive for the inclusive welfare of all. Therefore, the very core of our approach is public welfare through public participation. And this public welfare is not just for India, but for the entire world. This is the word of our Prime Minister. Now, we have a very dynamic, among all the foreign ministers, I always rate him as very high. He was not a politician, he was a, bureauc uh, he was a bureaucrat, he was an uh, Indian for his Foreign Service, and in 2019, he was been inducted and made, made to, be the, uh, to be the Minister of External Affairs for, for the country. As India rises and its capacities and capabilities grow, it will naturally contribute more to the world as civilization state re-emerging on the world stage and that draws on its heritage will obviously create its own imprint. As a full-blooded member of the Global South, as a mem system that intersects too much with the West, and as a polity with a flavor that is uniquely its own, India's trajectory will surely influence the redefined the whole world order, but today things are changing, and he's one man who is literally, who is one man who really tilt and deflect the, uh, the, their narrative and asserting new nar uh, narrative, to, uh, narrative to the international politics. Now, India's foreign policy paradigm shift since 2014, citizen-centric policy. These are the core ideas of this present government. India at a global height. India's neighborhood first, expanding global engagement, engaging in new construct, India's global initiatives, first responder in a crisis, where is rescue operation or humanitarian assistance. For the people, development partnership, connecting with our own, in the pursuit of Vasudeva Kutubagam, 75 Azadi Ka Amrit Mahajab, the world celebrate with India. These are the kind of approaches which this government is taking up in giving new image of India to the world community. Now, let me just take us back again to the Indian neighbor. India and her neighbor. India shares her border with nine countries. India has 15,106.7 kilometer long land border, 7,516.6 kilometer long coastline. To understand geopolitical problem, India has a border dispute with China, Pakistan, Nepal, Myanmar, and Bangladesh. Complex history, geography, dispute related to this border, which make India one of the most complex border nation in the world. Now let's see the, the map, Indian map and her neighbor. Yeah. See, India is in the center of her Southeast Asia, I mean South Asia. Up there is China, and in the west we have Pakistan. In the north, China, Nepal, Bangla uh, in the north Ch we have Nepal, Nepal, China, and then Bhutan. But that northern part, is fully the mountainous region, which is not very easy, easily accessible between China and India. But in the western part, west, northwest, that is Pakistan, this is a problem, this is the region where we are having a lot of problem. We fought war with Pakistan, uh, we fought war with the Pakistan, and in the southern part of Pakistan, we have the Thar Desert, and the rest of this, the, this, coast, this is the whole coastal land. This is where we are, bound by the water. So India lies in the center of the, this whole region. Afghanistan on top, next Pakistan, then Sri Lanka uh, down here, and then Maldives somewhere around here. 
then Myanmar is there, Bangladesh, and this is where we are. India, by position, physically, we are in the heart of the region. And not only that, in terms of population, in terms of economy, in terms of military, in terms of, in many respects, India, particularly in this region, becomes the center of gravity. If you look at Saudi, Saudi Asia map, this is where we are. So China is our neighbor, yet somehow, because of the, the terrain which I've explained just now, we are not having that close proximity. But in the late, during this corona period, now with the world advancement, both China as well as India, now they are trying to influence their, their they are trying to, uh, they, are, they started asserting their influence in the Indian subcontinent. Now, neighborhood first. These are the kind of initiative which the government have taken up, and the policy towards neighborhood is well orchestrated by what late Prime Minister Atal Bihari Bajpayee, who once said, we can change friends, but we cannot change our neighbors. The only mantra is learn to learn is learn to accept and adjust each other. This is the only option that is left before us. For us, if you look at India and Pakistan, ever since independence, before independence, till now, we are having a problem. Confronting against one another is not going to benefit either of the party. But somewhere, this is how things are with us. So our leaders, Indians, we are known for our tolerance, we are known for our patience, and Indians are in many ways more, they take a more matured and elderly role in, in the region too. But somehow, we have a neighbor who are always having a problem with us. But nevertheless, whether we like it or not, this is something which we cannot do away with. The only option is we need to somewhere try to help each other and just learn to get along with one another. That's the only way for us to move forward. You get into war at this juncture, you are not only, whether you win or lose, that is not going to be the, you both are going to pit, yeah, you both will go to that pit. That's how the government of India sees, that's how the leader of the Indian sees, and that's how we are moving forward. India neighbor first. Policy accords institutional priority and centrality towards our friends with sheer borders and, all, all right. With sheer borders and beyond it, it is guided by a Consultative, non-reciprocal, and outcome-oriented approach. I think a good number of our speakers earlier, they've already reflected this. So in this way, our leader, Modi as well as the, this our fin uh, foreign minister, they are being in any given situation, whenever there's a problem, when, wherever they, whenever there's a crisis, they are the one who not only, you know, government take a lot of initiative in addressing our immediate neighbors, then immediate neighbors, where is the, uh, during the corona period, in the, during corona crisis, earthquake in, in Nepal, then the, uh, uh, in the Bangladesh, the Rohingya, all those, we were the one, the Indians, we are taking that kind of role in order to influence, in order to let them know that we are with them, in that way we take their confidence and then that's how we move forward in the international politics. I think uh, the time it's quite short, I may not be able to just, I'll just give only the gist. And apart from this, India, during this period, we are taking a lot of initiative. Earlier, it was, the, it was we who follow others. Now, the government of India is taking initiative in such a way that we are the one who is initiating and they are the one who is following us. That's how we are literally, you know, displaying our card in the international politics. See? engaging new construct. These are initiatives which the government of India is taking up. The first respondent in all this, see, these are the government who have taken up this issue during this time to address our, our Indian foreign policy today. If you look, it's not only it's citizen-centric, citizen but it's a human-centric, our approach to the development partners. The whole things are making digital. We are making, we can easily these days access all this information or 
even changing our Aadhaar card or changing our, you know, you know uh, driving license, everything. Things are even passport. All these things are making things easier for the citizens. Connecting with our own. We, the Indians are very, Indians, India because of her IT technology, the power, we are everywhere in the world today. And Modi taking this government have taken a lot of initiative how to get uh, rich, uh, how to get, uh, how to connect with these people. In that way, both the parties are benefiting through this. In a spirit of Vasudhi Deva could, uh, we are reaching out to the world. Say, 75 Azadi Ka Amrut Mahatsav, celebrating India's 75 years of independence, is being observed across the world in the spirit of Jan Bhakti Dikari, celebrating for all. Indian missions are organizing numerous activities in association with the members of Indian community, Indian diaspora, Friends of India, and the host government, making India a truly global. I think uh, time is not permitting me to go further, so I think I'll wind up from here. So the time is open for the house. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Likase, for the elaborate presentation. I'm sorry we are not able to give you sufficient time to finish your presentation, but uh, uh, thank you for the insightful uh, thought. Uh, on Indian foreign policy paradigm shift after uh, 2014, that is NDA 2.0 after Vajpayee. So, uh, yeah, nothing uh, uh, remained the same. Uh, change is constant, that is what they say. So, India had been following the norm and uh, after that, the privatization, and then when this Modi government came, we saw an uh, invigorate neighborhood uh, policy. So, uh, yeah, thank you for presenting to us this. Like I have uh, committed, I, I will, we will spare two to three minutes on uh, questions and comments. So if you uh, want to say anything, uh, you can take time. Uh, speakers are here to clarify uh, if there is any doubts or even comments also. We'll give time, two to three minutes, if there is any.
century. This century is called Asian century, right? So in this Asian century, uh, there are a lot of rising uh, Asian powers that we take. Russia, China, India, Japan, Vietnam. Uh, all these countries are having a national sense. If you look at national self of these countries and uh, will this country going to have a black means have we seen that multipolar class in the issue uh, you know power regime so hopefully as we I'll say like Dr. Mikasa was also mentioning this uh, you know uh, that enemies friends friends of friends are we locating that modular video of in terms of that, uh, can we really replace this friends of friends with this enemy of friends? I mean, like that model, if you locate that, I mean, these are the things which I really want to understand. So, thank you very much. Any more to save time? We can take, yeah, together. Okay. Okay, please, uh, either of you can, or both of you can take uh, the questions one by one. Yeah. Uh, these are all very interesting questions. First, I want to ask you that when you are talking about the soft power tendency, do you think in India is a soft power? How do you view? We talk about Vasudeva Kutumbakam, we talked about Buddhism, we talked about so many Upanishads, Vedas. But if we consider the foreign policy of India since 1947, we have fought almost one war in every 10 years. We have already fought 10 wars already. So India is not a soft power in that way. India's problem is that within the G20 framework, India is projecting itself as a soft power, as I've already mentioned. I'm not negating Buddhism as a first soft power instrument. But who is going to take Buddhism apart from Southeast Asian countries, few of the Southeast Asian countries, maybe one or two, Myanmar or Thailand? Malaysia is not going to take it. Indonesia is not going to take it. If you say that Buddha's enlightenment is here in India, Two countries might take this kind of ideas as a soft power tendency. Peace, harmony, these are the words that we have used, we are using. But if we consider in this foreign policy since 1947, how many wars we have fought? Every 10 years, one war. So how could you say that we are a soft power? We can't say that. Yes, I, I agree that in 1962 war, uh, I don't know that it, it may not be India's fault, but in every other war, there was India's involvement, somehow or the other. 
Second important question, the civilizational state. In early uh, 1918, maybe, or 1920, Gore went to China. He was vehemently rejected by the Chinese youth in Beijing and Shanghai University. They said, go back to India. India was a colonized state, and Tagore came back with a very, very deep heart and established uh, the China Bhavan at Shanti Niketan in Vishwabhat University, at Shanti Niketan Bolpur, where he formed the university. The question is that, with the diminishing, that, that is the narrative I gave in the morning, with the diminishing of Buddhism, the relation between China and India got diminished. So India is again taking the same instrument to build up the soft power projection to the world when it is no more there in the Indian understanding only. How many Indians do understand what Buddhism is, what harmony is, what peace is? You just go to any television channel and say that India is going to fight war with Pakistan, everyone will start shouting Jai Hind. That is the question of understanding the narrative that I was talking about. And the second important, important question that clash, civilization will clash each other. Because the philosophical, now I'm coming back to philosophy, the Basil Daiba Kutumbakam. This idea was given in 1800 uh, 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 and uh, long back by Swami Vivekananda in Chicago, 1893 in Chicago Parliament of Religions. Like you don't need to be a Christian to become a Hindu or you don't, not be a, don't need to become a Christian to become a Muslim or something like that. So he has already established the essence and importance of all the religions in uh, 1890s in the Parliament of Religions. So we are not taking back that. We are using Buddhism without understanding where it will work and where not. Because Islamization process has already started in the Central Asian countries. China is taking the advantage. But India could not take the advantage. Because you go to the Arab states and will understand what Buddhism is. And then if they don't understand how it is possible for India to connect. If we cannot convince our friend that what I'm going to say, how can I just make the friendship more, more deeper? We cannot. So it is, and soft power tendency, as I've already mentioned, Asian century, China and India cannot make it together. It can't. We don't believe each other. So they can give some money to some of the Indian companies to build up small-scale industries in India. But politically, it is not possible. It is simply not possible. So that's why the question, next question comes in the balancing role. Yes, we are balancing because we are not, it is not possible for India to counter China immediately at this stage. China is our only threat. What we will do other than to balance China? But India is not the sole power. So that's why India is trying to find the quad arrangements. India is trying to find United States. India is trying to find Japan or Australia. And you see the enhancement of military exercises in the Indian Ocean. India is starting. India has already started. We are doing military exercises with the French people, with, the, with France. So these are the things India is starting. So there may be an alternate internet system also, some, are, some years after the Chinese system and the other world system. That is the question I must I again raise in the morning that we talk about democratization. We talk about democracy. How many countries in the neighborhood India has played a very positive, positive role to establish democracy? None. In Bangladesh, what India is doing? Fine. We have a very good relation with the present government. We understand. If the government goes away, it will be difficult for India to manage the situations. But still, you have to believe and have faith in democracy. We are projecting democracy, but we are not adhering to that in the neighborhood at this stage. So these are the questions. We are not, we are balancing power with the help of the other superpowers in the world. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry once again for the shortage, shortage of time for discussion, but we are running behind schedule. So I hope we catch up in the uh, later sessions. Uh, in the next session, we have the presentation session. So as informed in the uh, inaugural session that uh, the second hall will be just below this floor. So keep in mind, you, you, uh, we will 
you know, spoil you in choices. So wh whatever topic you wish to attend, you please choose and uh, be there. S sessions will go simultaneously, presentations. So uh, that is uh, an information. And another information is that uh, kindly uh, step out of this and go to the, uh, in front of the porch near the flag post for uh, a, a photo, for a, for a photo session right after this. So that is uh, another request. I thank uh, the uh, uh, speakers, sub-team speakers, both uh, Professor Iman and Dr. Likase for uh, the wonderful enlightening sessions, for enlightening us in their respective topics. And I also thank all of you for your patience, uh, hearing, and uh, participation. Thank you, and see you in the next session.
most of them are presenting online. There wouldn't be six people here. Oh. Blue, blue, check. Blue, check, test, test. Check, check, test. Test, test. Check, test. Check, test, test. Hello, check. Gonna do the hello, check. Check. Master, young officer, you wait on the check, check, test, 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 test. You better leave a long distance. Check, test. Okay. Ah.